want to do this morning quickly is say, I want to try and build into the vision and the future and the life of the church while still actually leaving a great sense of substance of God's word. So what that means is I would refer to the vision and then the building blocks that we use to be able to measure our growth. Any person that's in business, if you hope to have a successful company, soon realize that winging it only is meant for the menu at KFC where you get the wing it nuggets. Other than that, nothing is ever successful when you wing it, hey? <laughs> so what I have found is it's an incredible helpful tool to be able to measure our success. And the success that I'm referring to is not man's success, it's obedience. Because that's, if you've heard me say, your name is written in the book of eternal life. And the only thing that's added there as accolades is actually obedience, not diligence, unless it has uh, been preceded by an instruction. So for us to be able to lay hold of that, seeing that ambassadors of Christ, which means your entire life is instructed by one. We have been taught in a democratic society, we would say to our children, what would you want to be? White, little petal, my flower. What do you, I want to become a unicorn with rainbows. Oh, my boy, you can, you can be that. It's not true at all. It's an overcorrection. One of my mentors, helpful always, particularly in this time when you would want to speak in a difficult context, he said, would say to me, Keith, the answer to abuse is not non-use, it's correct use. And when we consider that we, re we, we receive Christ, but our raising is in a democratic society, it would stand to reason that there's some cultural biases, biases that we have adopted that are not his, but the world's. And so when we would consider that God has given us eternal life and then extends to us purpose and plan, there is something to say that do, who believes that God is perfect? Who believes that God is good? Who believes that no evil resides in God? Who believes that their salvation was by grace? He opened your eyes that you could see him, that you couldn't save yourself. So when you feel a rebellion that God is gonna tell you what to do, that's because those that have told you what to do before are subject to evil. But this God that is a good God, when he says to you, Henry, I want you to do this. There should be, because we're building towards a high view of God, that this instruction would be the best possible outcome for my life. So to be able to do that, we've seen, we can't just proclaim to be ambassadors of Christ. You must in fact be, embody the representation of that. So how do we do that? Seeing that there's four building blocks. It's believing correctly, belonging to the things that he's called us to belong to, become to resolve those things, like I was saying about a cultural bias who would say to your children, you can be anything. So I ask God, how will you safeguard me from my own son not becoming my idol? Because I've noticed when we speak to parents and we say, how about this? Then I see them trying to navigate, you're telling me I'm a bad parent and this is my child, who are you? So I said, God, that's gonna be me, because Annika was looking like, we had a tire business before, and whenever you saw this on a vehicle's tire, it was bad news. But it's God's good news when it's like that. But for me, it was, uh oh because I will be susceptible to the same. And he gave me an uplifting message. I'll tell you, I was in a cloud for a week. He said, no problem, why it's born dead. Until he comes to know me, he needs me. That gives you a greater sense of fear of God than anything else. And I realized the scripture is true. Unless you hate your mother, your brother, your father, your sister, your auntie, your uncle, your brother, your cousin, all of those, for me, you cannot be my disciple. Because the animal we will use, the idols in our heart. And then there's the becoming comment, uh, <laughs> component is that if we believe correctly, we belong, we become, and then we are sent. So a lot of us, these things are constantly happening. It's not that they 
progressively happen, but it's something that when, we, when you come into the life of Victory Church and I hear you speak, I am assessing your believing, your belonging, your becoming, being sent. And some of us, we move into a place and you're like a pair of old slippers, like Monet. If you need company, that like will just operate and, and it's liquor, and then we'll get some other people that will kind of crawl in in a year for like eight months and you still don't know their name. All of those are fine, but it gives us an indication to measure because if somebody doesn't get to the place where they feel they're at home, then there's no value that they would be able to add and we would be able to extend. So the light that we have been given shouldn't be under a lampstand, but it should be out on a hill. So you get where I'm going with this. So looking at believing, I'm going to be speaking into that. And I have work for us to do this week. So I've chosen which one so that you have an opportunity to work with. God has extended us the privilege of being able to work in the city to be a representation of his kingdom, not Victory Church. We might just actually change the building's name to the embassy so that we don't get confused because we don't have a kingdom. We just have an area of responsibility and influence. Everything is his. So I often find helpful things that I can say, like why it is dead, because I will not be able to escape what every 20 billion other people before me has not escaped. So I would need to put something in place. <laughs> it's not gonna be long now, son. Don't worry. <laughs> that was actually something that God spoke to me in worship and he was saying to, to me this, is that we need to become very comfortable in uncomfortable situations. If you were allowing kids, your boss, your neighbors, your auntie, your uncle, whoever to disturb the force in your heart, you don't have the force you really need. You need a, yeah, you need the right one. So when I'm saying you get to work with this week is we always endeavoring to work with God because when we would say that you are bound to God in obedience, we are not exempt from that. For us as an eldership, as a team, we, we trust, we pray, we work together to see what is it that God's given us to do. And what we're really seeing is that for us to really ignite not only everybody else around us, but us, is we need the Spirit of God. We need His presence. And so there are people that have got gifts. And mine is not singing. If I start with Ava Maria, well, just by the end of the note, you'll all be gone. So God has entrusted to each good gifts to be able to do what needs to be done. And so we've called in a brother so that his gift that he would be able to deposit and leave when he goes is that the spirit of God in power remains with us. So we have the privilege to pray that in. So in believing correctly, what I'm talking about today is the importance of prayer. And so if you wanna turn with me to Luke, 11, two to four, this is Jesus' instruction around prayer. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. So we don't have synagogues, but we have a church. We have men's groups, we have fellowship and we use our terminology, brother, you know, how are you? Oh, the Lord is good and you know, I was just praying the other day, but it's words. I'm not saying that language is unhelpful, but if it's not actually expressing our belief system, then it is just hollow words. So he's actually cautioning against that. And when you would say, surely I say to you, they have their reward. It's not a positive. It's almost when you know somebody is going to get a fine, because they did something wrong. And you would say, assuredly they have their reward. That's what it means. But when you pray, go into your room, when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So I mentioned in the first component that when we, when we pray and or we use terminology that expresses that we pray a lot. It's something that the people around us might be impressed. If I put my mind to it, I can string a long line of eloquent words together that would intimidate the room that maybe only five other people or three other people would risk to pray. But the reality is that all of the words that I expelled, God paid them no heed because he is not like man. He is able to discern to the depths of my heart. So when you would see this is playing to the audience, it's of no value. So what I'm trying to put here is not to talk down somebody that's a confident prayer. Pray boldly and with confidence. And when it's talking in the scriptures and saying, focus in the the, the quiet in the bedroom, it's not giving you approval that you're afraid to pray in public. We need to be very focused on what the word is actually saying And sometimes what the enemy would like us to do is to take scripture to safeguard that wound that he is still to heal. So I'll leave you with this as far as um, that verse five is concerned. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. Is there is no value in delivering something publicly that is not being invested in privately. So you might be able to see somebody with a successful business, they've got all the signs, they've got the fancy vehicles, and then in five years' time, you see they've gone bankrupt because they invested in all the visual aids, but they never invested in all the aids that they would need to win. But when you pray, go into your room. Private work brings about a public demonstration. So when I asked you for this week, would you commit yourself to prayer for what's coming? We have obviously a great sense of uh, excitement to participate with God. I would say almost a healthy ambition. So when Rick would refer to bums on seats, he's referring to working with the king. He's not talking about filling the seats here to look like an impressive church. We want to be an impressive church. But an impressive church can only be an obedient church which means you and I are understanding our position and place in God, the mandate that he's given us, and exercising and working that out with obedience. Because obedience is something that is pleasing to God. Now, I will share on this at another time, but I want to add this, that the obedience that I'm referring to is not focused on the law. It's when your heart has been transformed and you are desiring to delight in God that your ear is inclined trusting that the Spirit of God is going to speak to you today and you're going to have the amazing opportunity to participate with what He wants to build and do. It is not exempt of the law, but what I'm concerned about is we've been raised in a way that says, you may not do this, you must not do this, you have to do this. And if that's what you're understanding, that is only a component. This is referring to already receiving Christ, the Spirit of God, and exercising trust that He is speaking to you in your area of responsibility, in your businesses, in your homes, with your children, with your wives, with your husbands, and all of those things. Verse seven, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that will be heard for their many words. Consider how you've been taught. I, I would sometimes, um, and I'm going to use this as a reference, and there's a lot of us that do it, so it's not worthy of, of an introspection that you would feel silly, but if you would hear, we've been taught to say like, Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day, Lord Jesus. You, are Lord Jesus, are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You, Jesus, are... Now, has anybody ever had a conversation with you like that before? So there's something what I'm trying to say is in this measuring, consider how you've been tasked to speak. Because when you speak like that, you would hear Brian talk about sometimes about a back brain, which means 
that there's actually a bit of fear now in the speaking. So you just go to this thing and you pull it to the front. But the Spirit of God is here. He's, he's got the words, let your, let your words be in my mouth. So there's something over here of why I reference that isn't to ridicule and shame or to put anybody down, but it's to say, consider that the Spirit of God has got the very oracles of God in his mouth that he wants to speak to you. Risk, risk a little bit with him, you would be surprised and delighted in God coming through. Verse 8, therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. So the importance about that is God is revealing intimacy and reverence. Intimacy because there are things here that you're sitting with that I do not know anything about. And maybe it's for a good reason or maybe it's for a bad reason. But the point here is that God is saying the things that you're trusting for, the one that Justine highlighted this morning. God knows who you are. And so those things that we have need for, he wants to meet those. In the manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so a lot of us, when we pray, we taught about like saying grace, which is good. We should be thankful. rub dub dub thank you, Lord, for the grace. Or other more profound holy prayers, you know. Something with real, and in this journey, there's something that he's referring to now, things that we should lay hold of. So there's nothing wrong with taking this prayer and just repeating it. But there is something that's very important that it doesn't just become a mantra. We used to do it at school. And I mean, the guys next to me shoving, punching, pushing, and swearing each other and making foul signs. And then they say, our father, and you hear this, you know, like the echo of everybody just knowing exactly what to say, but you realize this is empty. So this, when he's talking about these things, what you can do is take these, this as a framework of what you should be focused on, what, what, your, what your prayers should embody. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Two points. Set your eyes on him. It conditions us for who we're speaking to. It positions ourselves and focuses ourselves. Because you know what's in your heart. And when you read this, you see what the Bible is actually demanding of us. And so if you're unable to do it, it's not by power, nor by might, by the Holy Spirit. So you say, Yera, help me. Because I'm over here, and this is what it's asking me to do. And you could meditate on that for as long as needed until you start to be able to embrace this. You can invest in scripture. You can search out God's word. You can find a friend. There's so much that you can do to be able to explore that. Verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Two points again. It's aligning hearts with what I'm English, but I, I just wrote something that I can't read. <laughs> and it's tight. When the days when you had the sheets and you could go, oh, I can't read my own handwriting. I don't know what to say now, actually. <laughs> so it's align your hearts with what he means. It must impact our minds and our hearts, our wills and our emotions. That's very important. Because there's something that God has given us this ability to co-labor with them, and he's tasked us with our minds. It says, renew your minds. Whose job is that? With what? His word, the spirit, engaging. So this is a focused reminder so that we would be able to focus on the things that is the kingdom. Your will will be done. Notice there, that's also not democracy, eh? I'm not going to ask why, what do you want to be one day? I'm trusting God to help me that Wyatt would be able to see what is the will of God. I'm going to be teaching Wyatt how do you acquire the will of God? How do you hear the will of God? How do you obey the will of God? So here's a parenting tip. If your kids are not obeying you, they will not obey God. So we, we need to encourage each other. You do not accept the things of the world that will lead to corruption in your own children. They must be able to obey you. It is not for... 
it's for, if you ask why, because when I discipline him, then I ask him, why am I doing this? And he goes, for my preferred future. So <laughs> he already gets it, and that attitude is a three. He's not even a teen yet, but he gets it. And the second one for, for verse 10, which is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is for reflection of my decisions, my feelings, and my actions. We base a lot on our heart. I feel, I say, I, and it's corrupt, it's sick, it brings death. But God, being able to, because I open it to him, will bring the life that I need. And a lot of my decisions that I make, if I don't reflect, I don't ever consider that I've done wrong. Um, verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Okay, there's two points here again. Focused and intentional around receiving instruction from God, both written and verbal. This is very important because I've seen throughout God's word is he gives, he gives direction, he gives the instructions, and he also gives timeline. Whether that be in a chronos sense, where it's in a specific time, he'll say to you, be there at two o'clock, or what he does to me is he says, drive to this place. The other day, Tarin, she was stuck outside the church here, and the Lord had tasked me to go to a place in wilderness, and he said, go there. So I said to her, I can't help you, I'm going to a meeting. But I have nobody that I'm meeting. I just have an instruction. So he didn't tell me a time, he just said go. So when I get there, this place is empty. There's not a single person there. And the next minute this guy comes in and I say, hello, hello, how's it? And he comes and he talks to me and I say, do you want to have a coffee? He says, sure, here's a coffee. And he says to me, I was driving in the car and I was busy praying and I was asking God all these questions. I've got some time. Spent two hours, climbed back in the car and drove. So we had a meeting, we didn't plan it. But that is what God can do with you when you're sitting with your stock list, when you're sitting with your boss, your children, your kids. He will give you the instruction you need, but he will not contend with a full mind and a full heart. So number two for verse 11 is trusting God in the, in the day to receive from him, from him what will fill us. So this could be a number of things, but largely I would want to say around provision. And th this one over here, I'll just put in a side note and we'll, we'll get to that at another point. But God, I was wondering if I was loyal to mammon or if I was loyal to God. And he just said to me this, this is your means of testing, is if you're inquiring of me with fear in your heart that there will be lack, you'll be on the street, how am I going to feed my children, all those things. You're asking me for provision verbally, but in your heart, you're asking me to pay due to your idol. Okay. So it doesn't mean that there isn't empathy and grace and mercy in that scenario, but if we hope to experience not mammon operating, but this God that provides, he must be eradicated from our lives. So this is something that's very crucial, but I'll speak on that another time to safeguard us actually getting through this. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Reflection requires action and doing life together creates opportunities for the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know the whistle. If you're my age and older, release those who have judged, repent and receive healing Love is a doing word and forgiving advances God in the territories of our heart. Because when I don't choose to forgive, what I've done is I've actually moved into the judgment seat. And when I'm in the judgment seat, I then become an enemy of a God. Because why? He says he resists the prideful. But it's not a, it's not a passive engagement. If you play rugby and you're trying to get past, what do they do? They resist you. Sua. I checked some of those oaks, Bismarck, you stand next to him in the airport, you think, I'm a big oak. That oak's forearms is the size of this. 
I would not want them to resist me. How much more so God? So there's something of when I actually go before God, it's actually not condoning the person's behavior, but it's putting myself in a position to submit, to humble, to trust that everything I need in God, no matter what's been done to me, I can receive from God. He can liberate me. He can free me. And a God that sees will not let those escape. And it would be rather better that a millstone be tied around their neck than they fall into the hands of God. And when you have the forgiveness that you know you didn't deserve, suddenly your enemy becomes your prayer project because you've already received what you have. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Weighing one's heart to remain vulnerable and dependent on God, relying on God and not ourselves, is safeguarding us. So what I mean by this is it is impossible to be able to journey through life where you won't get stabbed, maimed, hurt, Uh, crippled even by the probably more likely by the closest people around you and it's not saying that they have that intent or in mind but if we don't get our freedom to be able to be liberated then we will remain stuck so there's something in this and do not lead us into temptation is there's this reality that when Jesus went into the desert he was led there by the spirit of God but Satan came to sift and test to make sure that the good work that was done in him was secure. Do not shy away from temptation. But this thing, when it's talking about leading us into temptation, has a two part to it. Because if something in my life needs to come out, then, then God will take me there. Because it, the sin, Paul says, it's no longer I who sin, but sin. It's no longer I who sin, but sin that dwells in the flesh. So I have seen that there is no problem for God to allow us to experience torment in the flesh. We've been taught through prosperity gospel that no flies can touch you, no nothing can touch you, you can live in disobedience, you can be angry at God, you can do whatever you want to do, you just can experience love. And the truth is that the love of God is this, that he pursues us that the flesh might die, but the spirit may live on with him for all eternity. So there's something of a safeguarding that when we get to God and he says, lead us not into temptation, it's us allowing God to weigh our hearts that he might sift us, that we don't fall into the hands of the enemy, but we fall into the hands of a loving God who will deal with us with graciousness and kindness. Why? Because he says, the broken and the contrite, I do not despise, but the prideful, those are the ones that you'll be riding on your donkey in the desert. God will not abandon you, but it's, it's not going to be easy. For yours is the kingdom and the power, the glory forever. Amen. I'll close with these three quotes, which to me really um, inspired God's heart around prayer. And it's also people that are, two of them are dead. And one of my mentors always said, Keith, when last have you read a dead guy? They've got depth. For you and me, bro. <laughs> Prayer will become effective when we stop using it as a, sat, as a substitute for obedience. Prayer will become effective when we stop using it as a substitute for obedience. A.W. Tozer. This one is crucial. I promise you this one is 90% of our struggle. 90%. I'm not good at maths, but I can promise you by the number of issues in my own life and people that sit in front of me, it's not by intent, meaning I don't think that we do this on purpose, but the way that we've been raised is that there are things that we're involved in that lead to destruction. The importance of prayer rises in proportion to the importance of the things we should give up in order to pray. 
The importance of prayer rises in proportion to the importance of the things we should give up in order to pray. It's many words that can only be no other than John Piper. If you seek nothing but the will of God, he will always put you in the right place at the right time. I would say that is worth meditating on. His life was an exemplary life in the outworking. He's not somebody that you would possibly want to invite to your dinner table, but when you wanted things to happen for God, you wanted him there, Smith Wigglesworth. If you seek nothing but the will of God, he will always put you in the right place at the right time. And just in reading that, I can promise you that there's just such a sense of like, because there's absolute faith in the God that is above everything and all things. What I'm going to do is I'm going to link these uh, nine things on prayer. It's the different types of prayer. When it goes onto the, to the website, I'd like you to take a look at it. I'll just touch on the headings and then we'll close. But it, it talks about the prayer that you would pray. Once you've kind of done this prayer, you would need to actually direct your prayers further, deeper, and wider. And there's nine, nine types of prayer listed here. And as I said, it's gonna go on the website. I'll give you the link because it actually comes, I think, from the Desiring God website. And it would just be able to further and strengthen your, your prayer life with God. It's the prayer of faith. And this is the one, like, uh, if you want to test it out, you can go pray for Elizabeth. She's struggling with a leg. And you go and you, you trust the scriptures, you lay on hands and you pray for healing, corporate prayer, like I'm asking you to do through this week. We have these meetings coming up. It's not a show. We're not looking to fill this building for our number's sake or looks. But this city, we want for Christ. So we want to see transformation. We want to see uh, God's given us access, greater access into government for this year. I'm trusting God for supernatural things. I was conspiring with Brian and saying, when we go in there, we can't go in there as every, everybody else has gone in before. We want to see God move in ways that never seen before. And if they throw us out, we will work for the king somewhere else. We're not there because it's a show and we want to be seen in the right places. So then there's the prayers, prayers of request, which are the needs and the concerns that you have. Thankfulness, what God has done, a very crucial component for us. And prayers that is prayers around worship, meditating on who God is, consecration. Those times where we would sit at his feet and he searches our hearts, he reveals ourselves to him. Really, really important. So oftentimes when people say to me, prayer is boring, I realize they haven't been trained correctly and they haven't really experienced God. Intercession. It's an amazing, God's blessed us with a lot of people that really love to intercede. And I want to ask you for this week, would you intercede for what is to happen? Because we're trusting for it to impact our city, not just for us, more for the city. We have, a lot of us have what we need. And then the prayer of imprecation, which is God's judgment, etc. Now what we're trusting for is that God's appeal that his judgment would not fall, but that he would intervene. And then especially for this week, like we're trusting for and further into this year for the city, is that only what God can do, his servants are willing to lay hands on the sick, even raise people from the dead, specifically raise them from the dead so that they might experience eternal life living today. Amen. So Father God, I just thank you for the amazing privilege to be servants in your kingdom, to be ambassadors of Christ to be positioned as sons and daughters, that we are heirs. And so, Father God, we just thank you for that, and I praise your mighty name, Father God. You're amazing, and you're beautiful, Lord.